What a beautiful song. Before I begin, because this is the last time I have the opportunity to just talk with you, I would like to say thanks particularly to Pastor Matthews for uh, being so courageous as to risk bringing me over here. We'd never met before, he didn't know me. And I just thank him for the wonderful opportunity of coming here and sharing the wonderful things of the Lord with you. I'd also like to thank you so much. And I'd like you to thank you for listening and staying awake. <laughs> you may not realize the significance of the, that remark, but I'll just tell you about my first sermon ever. I was 16 years of age and my father was pastoring a number of churches and on this Sabbath afternoon at one of the smaller churches the preacher uh, suddenly backed out and my father came to me and he said son would you be willing to go and preach at this church and because it involved train journey and back in those days you hardly had a car but to go on the train was just a great experience. And I said, yes, yes, I'll go. And I went to this town, a seaside town. It was summer and it was hot. And there were nine elderly, beautiful ladies in the congregation. And I began to preach as enthusiastically as I possibly could. And suddenly one of them went to sleep. <laughs> Then the next one. <laughs> so I raised my voice, I tried to get more enthusiastic, and the third one went to sleep. <laughs> and I did everything I could. And fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, every one of them went to sleep. I decided the only thing that I could do was stop preaching, and maybe that would wake them up. So I stopped. <laughs> And they slept. <laughs> so, so, I thought, what do you do now? <laughs> I hadn't had my training at Ubold yet, although I never received training for waking people up once they'd gone to sleep. You're supposed not to send them to sleep in the first place. <laughs> and finally, uh, I thought, well, there's only one thing I can now do. I'll get the train and go home. <laughs> and I left. It was a naughty thing to do. And they slept on. <laughs> and uh, to this day, I have no idea what happened. <laughs> May the Lord forgive me. <laughs> Therefore, my remark, thank you for saying awake during this series. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the fellowship that we've been able to share together this week and the joy of being united in the things of God and in the things of Christ. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. May we, as we talk together this Sabbath day, be wonderfully blessed by the presence of your Holy Spirit, and may Jesus' name be held high. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Some months ago, I was driving along in my car, and as I was driving along in my car, as we do, I turned on the radio. But I wasn't particularly interested, I wasn't particularly listening, I was thinking about something, when suddenly I heard something that just caught my attention. <clears throat> what the announcer said was, there was going to be a professor of English who will now talk about the English language. And so I sort of listened. And as the professor talked, I was only half listening, 
He talked about the language, he talked about the beauty of words, he talked about the richness of the language. And then he suddenly said something like this, but the language does not find its beauty until a craftsman puts the words together and suddenly in that moment of inspiration, those words come alive and it is like dipping words into gold. Words dipped in gold. Suddenly my mind was alive and alert. And I began to think, yes, that's exactly what God's word is all about. Many, many words, but brought together by inspiration by men and people of God down through the ages. And suddenly the words of scripture are as though they are words dipped in gold. And I began to think of the words of Scripture that are dipped in gold for me. Text after text, and I'm sure it's the same for you. We are drawn by his loving and tender kindness. The wonderful passages that say, Be of good courage and be not afraid. I am with you and will go where, uh, with you wherever you go. Let not your heart be troubled. Golden words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want golden words. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Golden words, ask anything in my name and I will do it. Golden words. The words of scriptures are so rich and beautiful, it's just like dipping words into gold. I ask myself in the car, which are the most golden words in the whole of Scripture? And for me, there was only one answer then. And it's the answer today for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. These, for me, are the most golden words in Scripture. These words drive every other passage in Scripture. They drive every theology. They drive every truth. They de drive every declaration. They are, for me, the most golden words in the whole of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But wait a minute. How can these words be the most golden words in the whole of Scripture? I have two sons. Proud of them. Love them. But if I got my son and I sent one of them to a part of the world where I knew when they got there, they were going to be spat upon, they were going to be ridiculed, they were going to be beaten, and finally they were going to be murdered. What sort of father am I to send my son into that situation? Surely if anyone needed to go into that situation, I shouldn't be sending my son, I should be going myself. God so loved the world has actually turned off many people down through the ages. What sort of God are we dealing with where he wants to have sacrifice? He wants to have the shedding of blood. He wants to see his own son a victim of that blood. What sort of God is it that we're dealing with that would send a son into that environment? I believe these critics and these doubters have missed a most profound point that makes these words the most golden words in the whole of Scripture. And to explain that profound point, I'd like to remind you of the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Here is the most profound understanding 
the profound understanding that the Son that came was not only sent by the Father, but the Son who came was God with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was both with God, but the Word also was God. In other words, the Son that came, the Son that came from the Father, is equal with the Father in eternal time. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, we are reminded that Jesus Christ prophesied there, one day when he comes, the Messiah, he will be called the everlasting Father. He will be called the Almighty. Because in his true nature, in his nature before he ever came a servant of this world and ever became our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one we know as Son of God, is eternal, divine, and thought it not robbery to grasp equality with the Father. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 reminds us of something that is very important in this matter. This is the time the angel comes to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus Christ. And Mary in verse 34 of Luke asks the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? But then notice the answer. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One that will be born will be called the Son of God. Friends, this is one of the great mysteries of the Trinity. But it is so important for us to understand all the way down through the church's history since the time of Christ, there have been all sorts of divisions of theology because they have not understood this profound point and then the great significance that lies behind it. There have been those down in history, if Jesus Christ is Son of God, then he must have a beginning. Today there are religions going knocking on the homes around the world making that very declaration. There are those down through history that have come up with all sorts of variations on the theme. They've said, well, God must have been first in Christ, then in the Father, then in the Holy Spirit, or versions of this. The whole point that I'm making today is the most profound and the most wonderful point that the Savior who died on Calvary was very God with God throughout the whole ages of eternity. And when the scripture says he came and he was sent by the Father, he came of his own voluntary free will and he came to this earth and he was born a baby and being a, born, a baby on this planet, he therefore was called the Son of God. This is why I believe God so loved the world are the most golden words in the whole of scripture why for the whole of eternity forever and ever and ever and ever and ever into the past the father and the son had shared equality with the holy spirit there had never been a time in the whole history of the universe where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Divine Trinity, had ever been separated. The garden of the universe was theirs. Everywhere they went, they had praise and they had worship, and the worlds bowed down before them. The Lord God, the Almighty, Jesus Christ, shared these attributes. These were his rights. These were his divine rights for the whole of eternity past. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had never been separated until the time when sin came on this planet. And suddenly, there is a plan in place laid from the foundation of the world 
which is going to break up the family of God. I don't know whether that stuns you. The family of God living and existing in unity forever and ever and ever in time past. That family is now being broken up and that family is broken up and going to experience for the first time in the whole of the history of the universe, never before have they experienced personal separation. Probably I've spoken about my wife too much. But I like speaking about my wife. <laughs> and I try to understand the feelings and the emotions that the family of God must have gone through by looking at it from a human perspective. I know that is dangerous. My wife and I were working in Northern Ireland when there was a problem in a church in England and I was asked to go to this church and troubleshoot. I was asked to go rapidly and I just left Ireland and left my wife there and my family and I went to a church down, I won't say where, and this church, the accommodation for me was a caravan at the side of the church. It was November, it was cold, it was horrible. And this caravan had no electricity, it had no water, running water, it had no sanitation, it had no heating, and when you slept in it uh, the first few nights, the blankets were damp and there was moisture on the caravan that fell down upon, upon my sleeping bag. It was an awful place to be. As I visited the members and then went back to this caravan, and the loneliness and the coldness and the isolation, I felt the separation from the ones I loved. Finally, after a time, I said, I can't take this anymore. And I rang my wife and said, please jump on the ferry. I'll come up and meet you. And I went up to Liverpool. I met her off the ferry. And we had a wonderful weekend together. But then came the moment when she is to get back on that ferry. And my friends, I will never forget it for the rest of my life. As she walked up the gangway onto the ferry to go back to Ireland, I felt an ache a physical ache in my heart. I felt something that was tangible in here. And as she walked up that gangway and finally the uh, ferry left, and as I watched her go in the distance, she was standing there waving, tears rolling down her eyes, face, and tears rolling down mine. The pain just got worse and worse. And finally I blew her the final kiss and she was gone. I got back into my car and I said to myself, come on, pull yourself together. And as I sat in the car, I began to open my mouth to just talk to myself, to try and calm myself down. And every time I opened my mouth, the tears would come. I drove down the motorway for several hours. And all the time there was this ter terrible ache, this was loneliness, this separation. It hurt. My friends, I'm only using that illustration to try and capture just for a moment why the verse, God so loved the world with all his heart and love, is the golden words of Scripture for me. And that is because behind those words, the love of God compelled the family of God to break up from what it had been for the whole of eternity and begin to identify in a way so that we can be saved, the world can be redeemed, and God could reveal his love to this planet. Oh, God so loved the world. It changed the family of God. Not the nature of God, but the family of God. The one who was with the Father. The one who had been with the Father for eternity. Now empties himself. Let's go of the divinity. Let's go of the home that he loves. Let's go of the glory that he loves. Let's go of the worship that he receives. Let's go of the praise that he receives. 
and he empties it all and he becomes and lives as one of us and walks on this earth separated from the Father. Those words on the cross where Jesus said, My God, my God, why? Those wonderful words, Why have you forsaken me? I believe are the pain of that separation that lies behind this marvelous verse, For God so loved the world that he sent his Son, And the Lord is crying out because this hurts and it hurt him deeply to be separated from the Father. But he came and those words are now for me. The most golden words that you can find in the whole of Scripture. It is the greatest love. It is the greatest gift. It's the greatest need. And it is the greatest good. Everything in Scripture is driven by this wonderful, wonderful love that was displayed by the divine family of God. But we haven't finished with that love. Because something else happened that the family of God had never experienced before. They now experience separation. But the family of God now experience bereavement. Never before in the history of the universe had bereavement come into the family of God. But now on the cross, the Son is dying. All the love and the affection of the Father, all the love and affection of the Holy Spirit, the family is burning with love and compassion and desire for the freedom of the Son. And as the Son dies on that cross, the family are experiencing for the first time death, separation, and bereavement. Never before has God personally experienced this. My friends, my words are inadequate. I don't have the power at this moment to express what I feel so deeply. When the scripture says, For God so loved the world, he gave his love by breaking up that family. He expressed it by the personal act and that demonstration of love, that demonstration of energy, that demonstration of caring, so much so that it changed the family of God and I believe changed the family of God forever. For Jesus will always be our Savior. We'll see him coming in the clouds of glory as he left this world. We'll see him with the nail wounds in his hands. And I believe from the indications of Scripture and other counsel that we've received that Jesus Christ will never, ever again go back to that wonderful, divine, free existence. He will always be limited by his humanity, although divinity never, ever dies. In other words, Jesus is going to be identified with his people forever. When the scripture says, God so loved the world, it is talking about the greatest love, the greatest gift, the greatest need, and the greatest good that the universe has ever seen. It is the greatest act of love that can ever be seen in the universe. There will be never again an act of love greater than this act of love. And this act of love was given for you and for me. And because the Lord desired for Dalvis Elias, because the Lord desired for each one of you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and all of us on this planet, God so loved the world, the family of God was even affected in order to redeem us and bring us back home. I believe. I believe with a passion. John chapter 3 and verse 16 are the most golden words in the whole of Scripture. For behind the words is the most glorious love that the universe has ever seen. Behind these words also is the greatest gift. Back in the 1600s in Europe, 
a monk decided that he was going to preach the following Sunday in a cathedral and he was going to preach on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so the Sunday came and it was a Sunday evening service and as the sun began to set, the cathedral filled up with the people that had come to hear the sermon on the crucifixion of Christ by this monk. The monk let the whole cathedral become pitch dark. There was no light in the cathedral. And then he walked into the cathedral, and as he walked into the cathedral, he lit a candle. And he walked up to the altar. And he began to preach the sermon of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And to preach the sermon, he did not say one word. He just took the candle and lifted it up. And there on the crucifix, yes, I know our problems with crucifix. But there on the crucifix, he held up the candle. And he held the candle to the crown of thorns. There the congregation in the great cathedral, all they could see was in the darkness this one bit of light, and there were the crowns of thorns of Jesus. The priest just gently waved the candle for several, several minutes. The people focused on the crown of thorns. And then the priest lowered the candle and held it to the wounds in the hands of Jesus. First one, then the other. Holding it there for several minutes, and the congregation just looked at the wounds in Jesus' hands. And then he lowered the candle to the feet of Jesus. And there he showed them wounds in the feet of Jesus. Holding it for several minutes. And then very quietly lifted the candle and showed the wound in the side of Jesus. Then... He simply snuffed out the light and walked out. He had preached the sermon. The greatest love and the greatest gift. My friends, as we come to the end of camp meeting, I would like to make a plea with you. We have met together and we have fellowship together to be united in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been uh, fellowshipping together to lift Christ high. We've been united in the Lord. We've been united in the risen Lord. We've been united in Christ our Savior. We've been united in Christ the truth. We've been united in Christ in his church. We have been united in Christ the blessed hope. And now we're being united by God's Spirit in the love of Christ, in the great gift that was given. My friends, when we leave this place, don't make the gospel of Jesus Christ so complicated that we forget the power that is in the gospel that comes from the golden words, John chapter 3 and verse 16. We have as a church a marvelous message to present to the world, and the message must be presented clearly and with power. But there is no power unless John verse 3 and 16 drives through all that we say and all that we preach and all we, that we do. For this and these are the most golden words in the whole of Scripture. And in those words there is the power for that inexpressible joy. In those words, there is the great impossibility thinking in the name of the Lord. In those words, is worthy is the Lamb that was slain, amen and oh yes. And to bring that to pass, it all began with the very family of God being willing to be broken up so that we may be broken up from our sin and be adopted into that family and enjoy the glory of the Lord for the rest of eternity. The most golden words in the whole of Scripture, the greatest love, the greatest gift, the greatest need, 
and the greatest good. Why do I say the greatest need? I remind you of what the Lord went on to say in John chapter 1. Uh, chapter 3, I beg your pardon. Chapter 3 and verse 16. After he said, for God so loved the world, the Lord made a very beautiful statement. And he said, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love the darkness instead of light. But whoever believes by the truth comes to the light so that it may be seen plainly what he has done has been done through God. I don't know if you're like me. But I have done things in my life that I'm very ashamed of. And the Lord is saying through the family that was broken for us not only does God love us, but the Lord is saying there is now no more condemnation. I wrestled a little last night and wondered whether I should tell you this story. But I'll do it. I was a rascal in my teenage years. I mean a rascal. Although I've talked with some of my colleagues in more recent years, and I think they were bigger rascals than I was. <laughs> when I was uh, middle teens, I got up to all sorts of mischief. And one day a friend and I, we were in a town in the Midlands of the UK, and we saw this elderly gentleman cycle up on one of those sit-up bikes. You know, not the modern ones, the big sit-up and beg bikes. And as he rode down the street, he stopped and he went into one of the small townhouses. And my friend nudged me and said, come on, let's get the bike. To my shame, I went with my friend and I stole that bike. My friends, right now I could cry. How could I possibly do such a thing? Elderly gentleman, probably he could not afford a new bike. It was an old bike even in those days. And this elderly gentleman would come out of his house and he would look for his bike and it's gone. And it was probably his only means of transport. And my friend and I, we took that bike. I have fallen before the Lord since and I've asked the Lord to forgive me. If I could possibly go back and hand that bike back to him. If I could re recompense this man, he's dead, I'm sure now. If I could do something to put this act right. It still haunts me in my mind. I'm ashamed. I feel that I've done a very horrible thing. And every time I think of it, I'm driven to despair. What a terrible thing to do to an elderly gentleman. And I'm totally ashamed of myself. But all I can go is to this God of love. This God who allowed the family of God to be broken up. And I can just lose myself in these golden words. And as I lose myself in these golden words, I can find the forgiveness for my sin. Still I'm ashamed, but I believe that there is now no condemnation for what I have done. I have been forgiven, I am free. My heart and my conscience still smite me, but I cling on in faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ, the golden words of John 3.16 and the verses that follow, we are told that there is no more condemnation. The people of God are free. It is the greatest love. It is the greatest gift. It meets the greatest need. And it reaches the greatest good. The golden words of Scripture 
the most golden words of the whole of Scripture are these wonderful passages. And these are the words I'd like to leave ringing in your heart as we come to the end of this camp meeting as far as my preaching with you is concerned. Let me finish with one incident that I consider very beautiful. In the Second World War, one of the queues was moving towards the concentration camp gas chambers. The line was a line of Jews. But on that line, there was a nun who kept walking up and down the line, trying to comfort the Jews before the doors would open again and they would walk in the next batch into the gas chamber. She kept giving encouraging counsel and love, hugging people. And she came to the 16-year-old girl, and this 16-year-old girl threw her arms around the nun. And as the nun hugged her and wept for her, the girl said to the nun, Please don't leave me. The line moved further towards those doors. Please don't leave me. The girl was clinging. She wouldn't let go of the nun. The nun is now free to walk away. But finally the doors open. And the nun and this girl walked into the gas chamber. And the doors closed. We don't know, of course, what happened in that chamber. But I'm certain that that girl kept clinging to the nun who her, was her saviour of that moment, helping her go through this terrible experience. My friends, I believe in the, with a passion in the Sabbath day. I believe with a passion all the fundamental teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church I believe with a passion that when Christ is at the center of all these teachings, these teachings come alive and they sing to us of the glory of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But the greatest truth, the most wonderful truth, the truth that brings alive every other truth in Scripture is to be found in these golden words of John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Amen. Oh yes. Worthy is the God that has given us this great act of love, even breaking up the family of God so that we can be broken and discover the salvation of the Lord. I say amen, oh yes. I say oh amen to the marvelous expression of the golden thought and the golden words and the golden gift, which is the greatest love, the greatest gift, the greatest good and the greatest need that the universe has ever seen and can ever see. It is for God so loved the world that he gave. I leave you with this final thought. Make those words the most precious in your life. Make those words sing in your heart day by day. Make these words sing in your church. Make these words sing in your evangelism. Make these words sing in your witness. Make these words sing in your relationship with each other, in your relationship with the world. Don't hold conference sessions. Don't hold business sessions. Don't hold board meetings. Don't hold strategy sessions. Don't hold planning sessions without these words singing in your heart because these are the power that makes the will of God outstanding in this world. And these are the words that will drive his church to the glories when Jesus comes in great power and glory and we will go home to glory land with him. And we will be singing those wonderful songs. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Amen. Oh yes. Because God so loved the world.
that he gave everything for us. If you're willing to thank God for these golden words, I wonder if you'd be willing to join me right now by standing. What a beautiful thing to see the people of God standing before the throne of God. And we are saying, we thank you for the golden words, the love of which there is no greater expression than we find in John chapter 3 and verse 16. Would you be willing to pray with me now as we thank God for these words? And we say goodbye to each other on this glorious, wonderful thought. Would you bow your heads and pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, I find it so deeply moving to see my brothers and sisters who I've come to love standing in this place saying thank you for the love of God in Jesus. O oh, gracious Father, may each one of us be right with you. May we know the salvation of the Lord. And if we are away from the Lord, if there is a barrier, if sin is getting in the way, discouragement, if anger, if we see hypocrisy in others, if there are tensions in the church or in our lives, if there are difficulties in our workplace, or we've just come to the place we've had enough. Oh, gracious God, help us to look behind the words of John 3.16 and see the family in heaven that was willing to experience separation for the first time and experience bereavement for the first time so that we could come to Christ and be part of the family of God. Gracious God, may these golden words unite us today and forevermore in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, yes.